Good evening. I'd like to uh, call the January 18th, uh, 2018 meeting of the Board of Trustees at Johnson County Community College to order. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? As we begin this new semester and new year, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, trustees Angelina Lawson and Paul Snyder to the dais. Congratulations and welcome to your first board meeting. I would also like to acknowledge that trustee Nancy Ingram is uh, with us by telephone. She is, uh, she is in a place a little further south than we are, and, uh, but I'm not so sure that uh, your temperature is any warmer than we are today, but uh, Nancy, uh, we'll try to make sure we include you in the discussion. So. Um, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, first item is roll call and recognition of visitors. This evening's visitors include Dick Carter, Jonathan Lawson, Tracy Osborne Alchin, Dennis Batliner, Randy Pyle, Melody Rail, Nick Cole, Blake Coger, Doug Clark, Roberta Eveslage, Daniel Yoza, and Val Bell. Thank you. The, first, uh, the next item that we have is the open forum. Uh, the open forum section of the board agenda is a time for members uh, of the community to provide comment, comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people uh, plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium, uh, should be respectful and civil, and are asked uh, and encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion processes or are otherwise subject of review by the college or board. We have four registered speakers for tonight's meeting. Uh, the first one that I would like to call to the podium is Tracy Osborne Olchin, and I would remind you to state your name, your address, and the city in which you live. Good evening, Tracy. Thanks for being here. Good evening, Dr. Cook. I'm happy to be here. My name is Tracy Osborne Olchin, and I'm the president of the Overland Park Chamber of Commerce. The address is 9001 West 110th, um, Overland Park, Kansas 66210. And uh, welcome particularly to the new trustees. Congratulations, and hello to um, all the rest of the trustees. Um, I am here tonight representing uh, the Overland Park Chamber, and I really have uh, two purposes for being here. Uh, the first, as many of you know, last year the Chamber uh, celebrated our 50th anniversary. And our organization, when we were founded, we had some of the same founders as the college. And some of you know a little bit about that history. Uh, but upon uh, the founding of our organization, we set uh, forth a couple of purposes. And one of those was noting the absence of an institution of higher learning in Overland Park and in Johnson County. And so um, one of the first things um, our board Board, uh, decided to do was to support the bond issue uh, to help create Johnson County Community College and so we look very much forward to your 50th anniversary uh, this next year and um, one of the reasons that I wanted to come tonight was to talk in particular about our reflection this last year um, really um, reminded our board that public education is um, the top economic development tool that we have had in our toolbox um, for the last 50 years. And so um, I think sometimes uh, here in Johnson County we take that for granted. Um, we just assume that everyone knows that. Um, but it's worth reminding everyone that um, that doesn't happen everywhere. Um, public education from pre-K through post-secondary is absolutely critical. We hear every single day from our employers, whether we're talking to someone in retail or hospitality, in the tech sector, in legal or financial services, it doesn't matter what the business is, that work
workforce development and the search for talent, um, talent recruitment is their number one priority. And so for our board of directors at the chamber, it's their number one priority. And so um, I wanted to come tonight um, to say that it's the top priority of the chamber. And um, from my board of directors to you all as the governing body uh, of the uh, Johnson County Community College, first we wanted to say thank you um, for the great work that you've done for the past 50 years. Um, but thank you not only to you as the governing body, um, to Dr. Sopchik as um, your chief executive, um, but to every single person um, represented by those who are in this room, but we know that behind you um, is, a, is an entire cadre of other people um, who are um, back of the house, you know, who keep the classrooms clean, um, who cause food to be served, um, who keep the technology running, um, but also deliver education in the classroom. And every single one of those people is important to that process of making um, workforce uh, available and creating success for our students. And um, I'm here to say um, that the chamber wants to be your partner moving forward. Um, the second purpose, um, well, and also to say that sometimes you only hear complaints from the dais, and we thought it was important as the chamber to come forward and to say something positive and to say thank you. Secondly, uh, you all are aware that the City of Overland Park, the chamber, and Visit OP are embarking upon a visioning process called Forward OP. And so I want to issue the official invitation to participate as um, patrons of the college, whether you work here, um, whether you are a student here, uh, whether you're part of, of uh, the governance structure uh, with the trustees, we want everyone to feel welcome to come and participate on January 30th, Tuesday evening, five to, or seven to 9 p.m. at the convention center um, to participate in a brainstorming opportunity. Uh, Trustee Musil is the co-chair of this opportunity. I know he joins me in this invitation um, this is for everyone. It's planning for the next 20 to 30 years uh, for continuing to make Overland Park in this region a community of choice um, so that we can um, dream about who we want to be. Um, so this is for all ages. Bring your children, um, bring your neighbors, bring your family, and bring your coworkers. And I've got some information here. We're happy to provide it digitally as well. And so if you'll share this information and, and share that invitation, um, that's all I have this evening. And thank you very much for your service. Tracy, thank you for coming. Um, it's kind of interesting, at, at least to many of us, that the city of Overland Park uh, celebrated its 50th anniversary a few years back, I think incorporated in 1960. And, and then the chamber, just 50, and now the college is just 50. And, in my opinion, uh, the commonness of those three entities uh, started young and bold uh, with courage and visioning, and uh, all three are highly recognized. Your chamber is nationally known. The city consistently receives uh, awards. That's not to exclude other cities in the county because other cities have grown uh, exponentially as well, and, and uh, this college is nationally known. Uh, as co-chair, do you have anything that you'd like to reinforce with Tracy on the... Uh, January 30th, 7 p.m., Overland Park Convention Center. We need everybody there. Thanks, Tracy. Thank Appreciate you. it very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dennis Batliner. And uh, Dennis, if you would, again, state your address and city uh, and limit your remarks to five minutes, that'd be helpful. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Dennis Batliner, 10,000 Perry Drive, Overland Park, 66212. I'm here to talk about the uh, college's decision to cut the track and cross country programs and eliminate the outdoor track. My son was both a uh, distance runner in track and cross and a coach here uh, as an assistant coach. And I'm a distance runner. I'm just older and a lot slower. <laughs> but this is about more than cutting two running programs. If the two programs that contain nearly 50% of the school's student athletes are not important enough to maintain, uh, then arguments can be made about the value of any sport to a junior college campus. Of course, arguments can also be made about the value of other non-athletic programs. There are plenty of great stories out there illustrating how beneficial junior college athletics are to students, the college, and the community. And you'll probably hear some more of those uh, later tonight. So why was the recommend, recommendation to cut these programs made with no public input and no student input? Why was there no discussion and no questions asked when the committee report recommending these cuts was pre presented to the board last March? If instead of these running programs, 
The report recommended cutting soccer, basketball, baseball, or all sport, sports. Would there have been no public input, no student input, and no board discussion or questioning? Doubtful. The major and expensive changes being undertaken with the college's $103 million facilities master plan appears to have confused people's thinking about what is important. Does the college truly believe its statement that athletic and recreational facilities contribute to a strong campus community and support a holistic part of campus life and student wellness and the school's stated mission to inspire learning to transform lives and strengthen communities or not? These cuts are not about lack of funding or Title IX constraints. They're not. These cuts are about an educational institution that lacks the creative will to imagine other options. I ask that you reevaluate these decisions with input from the public, students, because track and cross country provide comprehensive benefits to all the students, the college, and the community. Certainly, programs with a 32 year history deserve another look and they deserve a track to run on. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis, appreciate you. Any being questions here. or comments? Thank you very much. The next speaker is Blake Coger. How are you all tonight? Good. I am Blake Coger, um, 24853 West 148th Court, Olathe, Kansas. Very six, good. 6061. Um, I actually have a couple, I only printed out seven documents because I counted seven board members on, on the website. I don't know what, what everything is exactly up here. So I am, I'm Blake Coger, as I mentioned, JCC alum from 2004 to 2006 from the track and cross country program. Um, you know, there are gonna be a lot of comments made probably tonight or hopefully. Um, and we've got the document I've passed out is a, is a compilation of what are probably hundreds of stories and comments and messages intended to get to the board and JCCC leadership from our community, our running community, the track and field community um, that supports and surrounds the Johnson County track and field program. Um, we, so I, I wanna share with you those as I realize you probably don't have time to get on our website, which is savejcctrack.com and our Facebook page talking about the event that we're having on March 10th. So if you would, please, I, I think it, it's, it's imperative that you read the comments and the words from people from this community firsthand and see the passion that really drives this effort. It, it, it's significant. And I, and I hate being in front of public people in, in, in public places, but it's, it's important enough for me to be up here and talk to you all. So one of, the, one of the stories, one of the hundreds of stories we've received, we got just yesterday, actually came from a man named Jim Teepin. Jim is married with two children and actually currently teaching at a university in Armenia. So halfway across the world from JCCC, the track and field program. He actually ended up graduating from historic and Ivy League Brown University of, of all places from Johnson County Community College. His story was this. In 1988, after finishing 313th out of 330 in my class at Olathe South, I understood that my prospects for graduating from an Ivy League university with a degree in philosophy were remote. And certainly, without Dave Burgess and JCCC track, it would have been impossible. Assessing the value of the track program based on some spreadsheet reflecting dollars and cents may provide a veneer of objectivity that can be used to rationalize a decision. But this approach, convenient though it may be, is flawed, and that much, that much of great value simply cannot, nor should not, be given a price tag. The ancient Greeks recognized the importance of athletics, especially track and field, in an ideal education. They rightly understood that the virtues cultivated in the pursuit of athletic excellence transcend sports and our integral qualities of a well-educated person. Surely JCCC should also recognize this and better fulfill its mission to transform lives and strengthen communities by using its considerable resources in a way that sustains the track program and achieves other worthy goals. So I, I could tell my story, I'm not going to, hopefully you'll, you'll read it in that packet or, or on our website. 
I had a wonderful experience at Johnson County. My, my two years here changed my life, and I can't, I can't say that enough. Um, it, it reinvigorated my passion for learning, wanting to go on and get a four-year four degree, eventually getting a master's degree from UMKC. Our effort isn't about um, antagonizing or second-guessing anybody's work or decisions. It's about showing the passion behind the program where the scale and magnitude that the impact of this program, and all of college athletics for that matter, but in, we're talking about track and field here, has on the community is, is tremendous. It, it, and it can't be evaluated on, on dollars. Um, I, we, we hope that, that this is an opportunity for a fresh start, maybe a, a, a period of reevaluation. Um, I, I realize the decision supposedly has been made, but. We're, re we're really hoping that there's a period where we can have a discussion or, or talk about the benefits of the program. There's obviously a groundswell of support around us. There are thousands of people on our webpage um, indicating that they're interested in our event. Um, obviously, the media has picked up the story. There, there's community interest in this. Um, track and field is the number one sport in high school across the country in terms of participation. It seems silly to me to cut a sport that has that much participation in high school and it provides an avenue for people to come to college. Um, and, and track and field touches the lives of people across the spectrum of diversity, backgrounds, education, and geography. Um, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be a Johnson County resident today if it wasn't for that program. So finally, the last thing I wanna say is please read the comments, please, please engage us in discussion. We, we strongly encourage you to join us on the track, the Walk the Track event on March 10th, and see us face to face and talk to our constituents and our community. Um, I'll leave it with this. With all of this, the effort in this community response, we hope you can see the tremendous value of the program, the passion behind it, a value that simply can't be measured by bottom lines and budgets or master plan calculations. The impact is significantly larger than at a quick glance. So we'd ask you to reconsider the decision. Blake, thanks for your comments. and. Uh I would just say to you that if you're uncomfortable getting up in front of speaking in a public forum, you shouldn't because you were terrific. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next speaker is Nick Cole. Um, Nick Cole, 12232 Connell Drive, Overland Park, 66213. Um, and like my counterpart, Blake, I also hate public speaking. So um, pardon me if I seem nervous or disgruntled a little bit. This is not my forte. But I do thank you guys uh, for listening to us today. It's important. We're passionate about it. I'm here representing, uh, like Blake and like Dennis, the Save JCC Track Initiative. Um, and that encompasses the cross-country program as well. Um, this isn't about the demolition of the track. It's not about the programs themselves per se. It's about the opportunities that this college is designed to provide to this community and the amount of opportunities that could be removed uh, by discontinuing these programs. So I'm going to do a couple things real quick. Um, I'm going to tell you my brief story. Uh, Blake didn't want to share his, so I'll tell you mine. And then I'll make a couple of points regarding some, uh, some suggestions as far as what was considered when the decision was made to discontinue the programs. So I came personally from a, what I would call a modest middle class. I was raised around here, um, Overland Park, Lee Summit. Um, I didn't struggle, but my family couldn't afford college. Um, I had minimal financial support, so my options were scholarships, uh, they were student loans, grants, uh, and personal income, all of which I utilized uh, partially through the track and cross country programs here at JCCC. Um, but I started out as a sprinter in track, and the only reason I ran cross country was to get in shape for wrestling season. So I didn't even run cross country until my sophomore year of high school and never at any point did I consider myself a distance athlete. I ran short distance, I ran fast, and I was pretty good at it. Um, my freshman year of high school, I anchored the 400 four by four for uh, our track team on varsity at the state meet. Um, so I had some leg speed, 
and I was able to eventually over time evolve my game, so to speak, to apply that to the distance events. Uh, I could close out those races fast. I can run guys down. Uh, but if I applied myself to something that I didn't think that I was good at and challenged myself, then that expanded my horizons a little bit. Um, but coming into here, uh, I had run 10 miles maybe three times my entire life. And we were doing that multiple times a week my freshman year here. And I hated every single one of those runs. <laughs> hated them. I still do. Don't like running long distance, but uh, I understand the benefits. And through that, through the practice, the struggles, the perseverance, and a lot of hard-headed comments from my coach, uh, I ended up placing in the top 10 at the NJCAA National Half Marathon, something that I never would have thought that I would do. I've gone on to run multiple half marathons, even the Kansas City Marathon since then. So um, moving on to the other part that I wanted to talk to you guys about that I think is very important to address. Um, there are a couple of reasons that I want to highlight that uh, Mr. Chris Gray here has mentioned as far as reasons for discontinuing the program. Um, the first one being student benefit or lack thereof from the dollars that are spent for this program. Um, one of the things he said was, the college feels like students, not enough students benefit from the dollars spent for this program. I would argue the exact opposite. This is the most beneficial from a dollar spent perspective out of any athletic program that this college has. And here's why. It is the most highly participated in program that this college has. As Blake mentioned, high school track and field is the biggest sport in the country for high school athletes. This college has a unique opportunity to capture that market here in the metro. It is the last junior college that has these programs, still today. The last junior college here. I don't know if you guys were aware of that. But from a student benefit standpoint, the question is, who are these beneficiaries? I would say they are the students and the families that support those students. And when you have the highest number of participants in these programs, those are the real benefits. Those are the real beneficiaries. So I'd argue the exact opposite of that comment. The other one that I want to highlight is the perceived lack of community use with the current facilities. There are some young athletes that I saw walk in from St. Thomas Aquinas who I know use this track, who they've rented from you for years. Um, there are thousands of community members who aren't even affiliated with this college who use that track for exercise at a time when it is on every TV commercial, every show, everything we see, radio ads about obese Americans, health issues, and we are removing a public use facility that can be used to better benefit the health issues that we currently have in our community. And Kansas, by the way, is one of the most overweight states in this country. So you're removing that opportunity from the community as well. But beyond that, I think that I want you guys, if nothing else, to understand the massive opportunity that this college has with the track on campus. Infrastructure has already been invested in when it comes to the cross country course, the indoor track, and the outdoor track. This is one of the only junior colleges that has those. I understand I'm buttoning up on time, so I'll be quick, I'll wrap it up. Uh, this is one of the only junior colleges that has those three facilities all on campus. And one of the things that Mr. Gray and I know has been stated by others is that there's interest in charging a gate fee for things like softball and soccer and building a new facility. You can do the exact same thing with track. And guess what? Track meets are all day. And they get thousands of people here. And their family, their friends, they come. That's a lot of people on your campus. And when those track athletes go to warm up, where are they doing it? They're not doing it on the track because there are people already running there. They're running through your campus. Between events, their parents are walking through your campus. That is a unique and huge opportunity that you guys have to show off the beautiful buildings that you guys are building, all the beautiful green space you guys have on campus, and to capture those gate fees that you're wanting from softball and soccer. And that's an all-day thing with thousands of people. To me, I'm not sure if that was evaluated or considered or if a study was done to compare the two. Um, if so, I would love to see it. 
but I'd be willing to bet that if we did an actual study, it would be more beneficial from a financial standpoint to keep these programs than to eliminate them. Thank so you, Nick. I'll close Appreciate with that. it very Any much. Any questions from Thank you? Thank you. Appreciate it. I would say to uh, Dennis and Blake and Nick, the three of you, that uh, I think I speak for the trustees and we say we really appreciate your passion. We appreciate the passion of anybody uh, representing a program that they've been involved in. And in your cases, you've had terrific successes. I appreciate the example uh, of the international experience. And uh, I think that's representative of many programs we have, whether it's culinary, uh, debate, uh, um, student senate, whatever the case may be. Uh, we have those stories. Uh, I, I don't want to take the time tonight. It's not our purpose in this meeting to, to dig into the detail, but I believe there are some uh, different um, perception of numbers. Uh, this current year, I think we have 37, 19 men and 18 women participating in track. I think at the peak we've had 55 to 60. So this, this notion of that track makes up a third of our student athletes uh, that's a misconnect with me. Uh, we have a student awards program coming up here shortly where we recognize student athletes in all of our programs and we usually recognize well over a hundred. So I don't want to get into a debate, but I would encourage you to sit down with uh, Randy Weber, our Vice President of Student Affairs and our President, uh, Dr. Sopcich, if there's an issue with numbers. Uh, I would say that the board has discussed this not just in the last 18 months, but we've had discussions about program review uh, for for several months as we lead up to this 50th anniversary. And it's, it's, it's not just about cutting a financial piece of our budget. Uh, when, we, when we looked at the campus and uh, the 50-year facilities plan, one of the issues we're concerned about is student flow, how easy it is for students to get from building to building, and, and where is the front door, and how do we, how do we just get along the campus and, and uh, uh, Dr. Sopcic and I had an event last night at Washburn University where we, we struggled getting around the campus because it was, the traffic flow was just a challenge if you're not there every day. And so this whole front entrance is going to be uh, re-examined and re-changed and, and frankly we've already invested dollars with that with the decision we made last spring. But again, I appreciate your passion. Um, I think we're well on the way. There, there, there are several reasons why this is part of a comprehensive plan. And we're doing program review in many programs, not just athletics. Uh, but uh, uh, thousands of people on the track, I don't know about that. Uh, we had the women's national championship here for three years in basketball. And our women's team won the national championship one of those years. I attended all of those games. And I don't recall any one night that the gym was half full. And so when we talk about the community engagement from day to day to day, um, I, I, I have a disconnect with you on that number. But with that, uh, I would say that um, unless a trustee has a comment about that, we'll move on with the agenda. Well, go ahead. Trustee go ahead. Uh, Busel and Trustee Cross. Well, I, I want to comment because I was chair at the time that these decisions were recommended after a study period of facilities master plan and program reviews and our budget needs. Um, they were presented to the board at the time, which was everybody here except Trustee Snyder and Lawson. Um, I, I, I want to disabuse the public of any notion that this is somehow anti-track or anti-cross country. There's a sense in these comments, and I have, I have gone to your website and your Facebook page to, to look at the comments. I flipped through these, and, and they're, they're passionate examples of people who ran track in cross country here, as my niece and nephew did, um, coming from small town Kansas, who got scholarships here to come run track and cross country before they went on to get their four-year degrees. And I appreciated that a great deal at the time because it was an important value to them to have scholarships. I didn't know at the time that our other students were paying those scholarships through their student activity fees. I mean, when you start to look at all of the factors, um, I attended track meets here when they were, when they were running here. Um, there, there just wasn't a great deal of, weren't a great deal of people, number of people there other than parents of the other schools, depending on how far away the schools were. This was not some fly-by-night, hidden from view, uh, off-the-cuff decision, it was like other decisions that are made here with respect to the budget, what our taxpayers 
should be paying, what our students should be paying, which students should be subsidizing other students. Um, and, and it is not about the fact that track doesn't contribute to making every person that participates in it a better human being, a better student, more disciplined, a better time manager, and probably a better person as they go forward. Any more than the United Nations Model UN or debate or International Student Club or Student Senate does the same thing. So it's a question of allocation of resources in the fairest and most reasonable manner. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm not happy that we made the decision, but I'm comfortable with it. I think it was the right decision at the time. And it's interesting to me that we are the last community college in the area that supports the investment, not only in the track and the indoor track and the cross country thing, but, but the, with students paying the scholarships and the general fund taxpayer paying for coaches, and operational issues, um, and that may be uh, one of the more relevant factors is that other folks, as they have used it, tried to figure out what an urban and a suburban community college ought to do, where we don't rely on athletes for our, for our enrollment, which a lot of rural community colleges wouldn't survive without um, individual students on, on athletic scholarships. Um, so I'm, you know, the, the best thing about this community is the kind of passion that we have from people um, about programs, um, I, I just think it's important that we get the, the full story out there about how this decision came about and why I still believe it. the administration made the right recommendation and the board um, made the right decision in following through on that. Thank you. Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm sorry. Thank you. No, we're, I, I don't want to get into a debate tonight about interchange. That's why I say I recommend that we meet with our administration, but Trustee Cross. Thank you. Some of us uh, did disagree with the decision uh, to eliminate the track. Um, it is the sport of democracy. I, I ran track. It was not very good and, frankly, threw uh, a shot in the discus. Um, but I think that uh, there are many reasons why I think this decision was made, though I disagreed. Uh, among them, in my mind, was money. Revenue matters. You know, politics matters. There was a, uh, a, a very unwise decision made by a previous legislature that dramatically impacted state and county and municipal agencies across the country in 2012, and we felt it. We felt it here. So uh, the administration will say that there's a lot of different reasons why we made it. I believe them. Uh, they have my confidence in that. Um, I think they're doing their best. Uh, and it's difficult to go to the public and ask for money. But sometimes I think there needs to be revenue enhancements in order to cover all of our commitments. Uh, with that said, I do want to just uh, side with my colleagues in the administration that there were numerous opportunities to come and discuss this. We meet monthly. There were open meetings. There were committee meetings. Um, uh, the hard reality of this Republican democracy is that decisions are made by those that show up. So um, I'm very sorry we had to do this. Uh, I did disagree with it. I just wanted to voice that there was some dissent among, uh, among the board. I thank the chair for the time. Trustee Lawson. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the words from my fellow trustees, and I appreciate uh, the comments that were made tonight, uh, as well as the emails that I forwarded to the staff and chairman. Uh, one question that I had was, was this decision, Mr. Chairman, uh, made to address the student interest? Well, I, I think that uh, in this case, these students would say it wasn't in their best interest, but when you look at the, we're a comprehensive community college with several programs. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the breakdown of how student fees uh, that, are, that are paid uh, are distributed, uh, we have a number of other programs where those student fees go to. And Trustee Musil mentioned the United Nations and student, uh, the debate team, student senate. We have a lot of non-athletic programs that support that as well. So I would say, yes, the best interests of all of our students are considered when we make that decision each time. But uh, the track and field people would say it's not made in their best interests. Sure. Just as if we were to adjust any other program, I would expect that people from that program would come and say, it's not in our best interest of that program. Sure. Yeah, I've heard some interest uh, from students voiced more for soccer. So that's why I was kind of curious okay. on the decision on that. OK, thank you. Uh, Dr. Subject. I'd just like to say a few words. I certainly would like to thank everyone who came up tonight and, and spoke. Um, it takes a lot of courage, uh, a lot of guts to stand up here and, and, uh, and, and be as passionate as you were. And, um, and it's wonderful seeing um, 
the same people who are passionate about, about a sport they feel so strongly about. Um, this was a, a pretty, a very tough decision. Eliminating anything on a college campus is, is almost close to impossible, and it didn't come easy. We made a strategic decision to do fewer sports and to do them to the best that we can. When we looked at our other peer institutions across the country and even locally, we have way more or had way more athletic programs than anyone else. Um, the challenge is today is that those programs become more and more expensive to maintain. And we cannot do everything, even though we'd love to do that at this college. So the facilities master plan was one component of this decision, and we're investing pretty heavily in the remaining seven athletic programs that we have. But what some people don't realize is 80% of our athletes are scholarshiped, full rides. And those scholarships are paid for by every other student here um, on this campus. And they pay that, those scholarships so we can have athletes who participate uh, through their student activities fee. The, um, and the only way that you can really grow that pot is one, you can have enrollment growth because now you have more students paying, um, taking more credit hours, and obviously that grows the, the, the pool. But the challenge in today's world with relatively flat or slightly declining enrollment is that that pot of money becomes less and less. So it leaves us with really the only option that we can do, and that is to um, ask the students to pay more. We'll raise the tuition on students so our athletes can participate. I, I have to say that um, I don't feel that uh, it's appropriate, in, especially in today's climate, when we have students who are food challenged, um, they struggle perhaps with, uh, with a roof over their head, they may not have transportation, um, and we're going to ask them to pay more so um, our, our athletes uh, can perform. And I'm never going to send across from a single mom with three kids struggling to get by and ask her to pay more in tuition so we can have an athletic program. I'm not going to do it. And if that's something that you all believe in, then you, please let me know. But I believe in that that single mom has the opportunity for success here at our college. And I believe that she can do so if we keep the cost as low as possible. We're probably the only school in the country that hasn't raised tuition on our students over a three-year period. We're probably the only school that hasn't raised tuition. That's a pretty good story. I'd like to commend the trustees for supporting the administration when they make those recommendations and also for their support of the facilities master plan and decisions that we've made. So thank you. I'm going to close the open forum at this time and our next item on the agenda are the awards and recognitions. And I understand we do not have any this evening. Uh, student Senate report, there will be no student Senate report this evening and college lobbyist report, uh, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Dr. Cook. The uh, legislature convened for the 2018 session on January 8th last week, and this is one of the uh, most nonplussed starts to a session that I've experienced in, in my 20 plus years of uh, being at the State House. A lot of uncertainty uh, being discussed and just a lot of uncertainty in general um, with respect to um, who, who is our governor, who will be our governor, when do those changes occur. Um, lots of uncertainty related to K-12 funding issues, which really drive the rest of the conversation uh, in Topeka. And, and then we have the issue of um, the budget hearings that occurred late in the fall revolving around agency budget requests, uh, trying to build up from, from several years of, of decreased budgets. Again, all just uh, puts together this, uh, I wouldn't call it a perfect storm, but it's, it's an interesting start to the session. Uh, there's even uh, an issue of not many bills being introduced, and, and so that means committees don't have uh, a lot to work with. We, we typically work through the first week or so with the traditional agency updates, um, annual reports before committees. Um, that, that sort of comprises the, the first week or so uh, of hearings in Topeka. Uh, as we prepare to start the third week of the, the session, there are not a lot of bill hearings uh, placed on the, the calendar. So again, uh, that just sort of sets the stage for things that are, that are getting ready to happen or, or not happen for that matter uh, in Topeka. Well, one of the biggest pieces of news was, was who would give the State of the State speech. 
Um, Governor Brown back delivered his eighth um, State of the State speech on January 9th and uh, didn't um, cover a lot in the speech, uh, but did focus in ways that, that he hadn't before on K-12 education funding. And so that was, uh, again, picked up in a lot of the media outlets across the state and was discussed and continues to be discussed as to how the legislature will, will address the, the court's um, edict on uh, adequate funding for, for K-12 education. The good news continues to be that uh, the revenues are flowing into um, the state's bank account, uh, again, in ways that we haven't seen in a number of years. That's due in, in large part, if, if not uh, mostly, to the changes in the tax policy that occurred from the 2017 legislature. Um, but there was a big boost in December where uh, a lot of people were prepaying some of their uh, income tax obligations uh, before the 2017 calendar or tax year uh, concluded. We'll continue to track um, what those revenues look like because, again, that plays into the larger picture of how things happen um, with respect to the rest of the budget uh, picture, uh, most specifically K-12, but right now, um, there's about a 200 million surplus in the state's checking account, at least on target for ending the state uh, the state's fiscal year. Uh, with that, um, one of the interesting reports that occurred earlier this week was an enrollment report that we usually don't have until after the 20th day, but it but it occurred a little bit earlier than that this year. Um, was in the Senate Education Committee, and I attached a copy of that to to the report that I provided to you. Uh, I'm not going to go through that, but I think that there's some interesting um, numbers in there that I figured you might want to uh, compare and contrast. Uh, it does cover the entire system, so the state universities as well as community colleges and technical colleges are in there, and there's a wide array of, a wide array of number disparities depending on um, locations, geographic locations, and, and areas of the state. Uh, again, uh, there's, there's a host of reasons, and, and we know that, uh, why those numbers fluctuate. Uh, interestingly, there, are, there is a two-year average um, the, taken over the past couple of academic years um, looking at the enrollment numbers. It compares both headcount as well as full-time equivalent, uh, which would include the, the credit hours taken. Um, so um, please take a look at that, and, and uh, if you have any questions later on, I'd be happy to, to answer them to the best of my ability. The uh, Education Budget Committee, Higher Education Budget Committee met yesterday. Uh, again, usually they begin their work in earnest uh, looking at uh, um, different institutional or sector budgets. Um, they're not even perhaps meeting next week. And so that, again, is one of those signs that we kind of pick up on, on um, just the speed and, uh, of what is happening with, with regard to the session. So. Uh, the House uh, Education Budget Committee is not meeting next week on higher education budgets. Um, we're going we're gonna to play this waiting game. Finally, today was um, Higher Education Day uh, at the State House. Uh, all 32 institutions uh, of public higher education were, were present at the State House. Um, a good turnout of all the community colleges, technical colleges, state universities, and Washburn University were there. Um, Jean Claude. Uh, was there, and I think Dr. Sopcich tweeted uh, a picture of Jean Claude uh, out earlier uh, at at the uh, Higher Education Day in the State House, uh, and and Kate Allen and, and um, Dr. Sopcich were there as well. Um, had a, a great opportunity to visit with um, many members of the Johnson County delegation uh, that came by our table, as well as others, um, while they were uh, set up in the rotunda of the of the State House. And then just a couple of notes on on some bills that have popped up. Like I said, there, there are not a lot of bills that have begun to make their way into the uh, legislative hopper. Uh, but one is a bill that was pre-filed by a Lawrence legislator uh, related to abandoned uh, weapons uh, left uh, in public areas. That bill is in um, the House Federal and State Affairs Committee. It has not been scheduled for a hearing. Um, I don't know at what point if it may be scheduled for a hearing, but, but we'll certainly be watching that. And then the other bill um, relates to um, part of the governor's budget recommendations through the Kansas CAN program, which would fund for a five-year period uh, 15 hours of concurrent enrollment at uh, community colleges uh, for high school students in Kansas. This is different than some of the other conversations we've had regarding concurrent enrollment. Um, no bill has, has been introduced on concurrent enrollment yet, but I did want to make sure that, that we followed this and tracked this particular bill as well uh, as it comes out of the governor's budget recommendations. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that, that concludes the, the items that, uh, that we've been seeing at least for the first week and a half or so of the session this year, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Um, uh, as I call upon the trustees, um, regarding the enrollment, I think it's, it's important for the public to remember that uh, with 19 community colleges and six technical schools, technical colleges, um, those 25 institutions, uh, and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but they far outdistance the total population of the, of the four-year schools. And, and I, I just stay, say that because we, in our meeting last night, and Dr. Sopcich and I will talk more about that later, but um, what does the community college do for you? And, and we had testimony tonight about passionate people saying, you've cut my program, and what does that do to my program? Uh, and the question of, did we consider all the interests of the students, and yes, we do, is that the impact the community college not only has in Johnson County, but the community college network has in the state of Kansas is profound in terms of enrollment, and we're always concerned about the numbers of, are we up, are we down, are we about the same? Uh, is it good news to know that the economy is up, so our enrollment is down, or the economy is bad, and our enrollment's up? But I think the basic point is that we represent a substantial uh, number of people uh, becoming educated in this state uh, and people of all ages uh, and, and people who are trying to redefine their careers. So that's one point. If you wanted to elaborate on that, fine, not necessarily. Uh, and the other thing I hear is that things are pretty quiet until the state decides the public, the K through 12 dollar amount. And I, I think publicly we've seen print from 350 350 million to 600 million, wherever that may fall. And it, it appears with your remarks tonight, Mr. Carter, that, yeah, the legislature's kind of waiting to see. Um, it seems to me there are other things that can be done in the meantime. And uh, uh, we have a lot of issues, so thank you for your report. I, I don't know what I said or if I asked a question in there, but um, I just wanted the public to know that the community college network's pretty profound. Uh, I think we have Trustee Lawson and Trustee Cross, and the others line up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have a question for Mr. Carter about Governor's State of the State of Union when he stated that he wanted post-secondary post work to be at 75% when Kansas Board of Regents has the forward 2020 at 60 percent, if I'm correct. Um, does that feel like an adequate goal that we can achieve? The question was to you, Mr. Carter. It sure was. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that I can uh, provide an adequate response for that, and so we might have to have a Supreme Court uh, edict on what an adequate response would look like. Um, I do think that um, that answer can be very different for um, depending on which sector um, uh, that you're talking about, because there are um, people who go back for retraining that might not necessarily go back for credit, uh, and, and there are different um, programs that... Uh, might be intended to carry someone on to a next course where they don't have a graduate, uh, where they don't graduate from a particular institution. I, I don't know that I can. I don't know that I could adequately um, respond to the percentages uh, that are offered uh, in, in his speech. And I, I'd, I'd have to go back and look and see exactly what he was comparing to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Right. So yeah, that's really it, kind of a non-response. It felt kind of aggressive to have 75%. So how did you feel that we are on track for the 60% goal that Cable has for us? Well, again, that's, that's system-wide. And so I, I don't know that I can um, speak to, to where the, the system is going um, with respect to uh, success rate. But uh, um, I certainly think that a lot of time was spent um, putting the, the, the Vision um, 20 20 program together so you know trustee Lawson that's almost like there's one sport that I'm aware of where no one knows the score until the game is over no one knows the outcome until it's over do you know what sport that is boxing we don't no one knows who's really winning officially until the judges make their decision what does that have to do with 60 percent of 19 community colleges it's hard to all keep the right score because we don't, we, we've been debating this issue of do we get credit for transfer of a two-year certificate or program to a four-year school. That's always been an issue of definition. Um, each of the 19 colleges have different needs and challenges. Uh, we discussed that at length again last night. 
uh, and, and this is an ACCT issue as well, <coughs> nationwide. Uh, we're, we're trying to get to 60% nationwide. That being for the public that 60% of your population would have a higher uh, post-12 degree uh, in, in the state of Kansas by 2020. Mm -hmm. And so the Lumina Foundation, the Gates Foundation, others are pouring dollars into these efforts to help uh, promote and support community colleges uh, in that effort. But how we keep score, and who knows what the score is until the end of an academic year, there seems to be lots of different ways to calculate that among the colleges. So get me out of this. <laughs> Don't look at me. Um, our, our, our Trustee Lawson, are you always going to be asking these kind of questions? Because we, um, the, the fact is, is, is that the, in the state of Kansas, um, it's a very much accelerated rate of trying to grow those numbers. Um, and it's, one, it's for the welfare of Kansas, um, but it's happening across the country as well. Um, because, you know, we live in a global society now, in a global economy. So if the United States doesn't, we're going to fall behind. So that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the context in which this is happening in Kansas. And the regions are doing everything they can to try to make those numbers. They really are. And you've got to give them a lot of credit for, for trying to do that. Trustee Cross, then Lindstrom. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Carter. I think uh, perhaps to uh, Trustee Cook's point, among the other things that could be done is perhaps restoring the cuts to higher education. Um, I know one of the region schools I went to has been dramatically cut, and community colleges, I think, were remarkably left alone for a number of years until we had a 4% cut last year. But uh, what chances are there that uh, we could have cuts to higher education restored? I think that conversation was pretty robust uh, uh, moving through October and into November and, and uh, the, the court I think put a little kibosh on what that those prospects look like uh, moving forward through the session. I would say that while the governor's budget recommendations, the initial glance at the governor's budget recommendations do not restore the 4% cuts, there are significant uh, improvements made in some of the CTE funding. Um, both in the current year and in fiscal year 2019. And CTE is? Career and Technical Education. And so that, that is a strong focus and has been for a number of years um, where the state government is putting some and of its excuse resources. Me, Mr. Carter, I believe that's one of the points of the facilities master plan. Exactly. Right. That's right. I mean, that's one of the goals. And, and Dick, was there some talk up there about potential 18% cuts? Well, I think that that's still sort of this, this um, issue that's out there. One of one of the uh, one of the budget committee requests uh, at the very end of the calendar year last year was to um, agency certain agencies uh, <coughs> to determine what a, a 16 to 18 percent cut um, to their budget would look like. Uh, again, that's very different um, for us as it is compared to some others, and other agencies are, are so depleted that that there's not even that uh, amount to give. And so I think that that's part of the conversation. I don't think it will become a reality. I think it's, you, it's being used as an example of this is what this looks like. And, and who is going to be at the table to help make the, the, the funding whole for, for K-12 education? And, and I think that's how that conversation is being crafted. And so it goes back again to what all of that uncertainty um, that we're dealing with in Topeka. <coughs> Trustee Lundstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciated uh, Trustee Lawson's uh, question. I, I didn't read the transcripts of the governor's speech, and so I didn't know that there was a more ambitious uh, uh, goal there. But I do recall um, when KBOR chairman, I think it was Kenny Wilk, uh, made the announcement of the 60% figure. And I, I guess if I could, I would like to ask staff to possibly give us a report on what the status is of that goal, perhaps at a future meeting. We, we can, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I just mentioned there, there was in one of the articles that we had in our clips about this, about the decline in enrollment statewide, that if you have fewer students going to get a higher education degree, whether it's associates or bachelors, it's a lot harder to get to 60% because there are just fewer people participating. So that's, that's the real issue I think right now is if we don't have people going to get certificates, associate degrees or bachelor's degrees, we aren't gonna get to 60% because we just don't have the bodies there. So that's, 
I mean, I'd like to report too, but that's the one thing that is, is clearly makes the goal harder if we don't have people going to school. Wouldn't it be easier to get to 60%? Of all Kansans having a degree? I meant of students. That's, the, the goal is 60% of all Kansans, Kansans having, a, Kansans. having a certificate or degree, mm -hmm. and if fewer Kansans are going to higher education, then that goal becomes harder to reach, so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carter. Any other questions or comments? Nancy, uh, we're not forgetting about you. Do you have any questions from the Deep South? No, that's fine. I appreciate Chair Muse, or excuse me, Mr. Musil's comments. However, that's, I was waiting to That's okay. He still thinks he's chair. That's okay. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> no. um, we were just checking to make sure you were still there, too. That was kind of the uh, motive. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Mr. Carter. Uh, next item will be committee reports and recommendations. The first item is collegial steering. We had no meeting in January. Our next meeting is in the first uh, Tuesday of February, and uh, we'll have a report at our February meeting. Human Resources, Mr. Cross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The Human Resources Committee did not meet this month. We will uh, meet again next month. Thank you. Learning Quality, uh, Trustee Lawson. Yeah. Uh, Learning Quality Committee did not meet in January 1st. Uh, information was shared within the commu new committee, uh, and that is in the c consent agenda of the board packet. The new committee members had a planning meeting in January. We sorted through the Academic Quality Improvement Program, which is AQIP, uh, the eight-year initiatives, the AQIP systems pro profile recommendations for the college, the current AQIP, pro pro uh, excuse me, current equip projects happening on campus, the JCCC systems appraisal feedback report, and the Kansas Board of Region indicators. Majority of the equip recommendations for the accreditation are functioning well, uh, with two remaining, one being the academic program quality with retention and persistence. That is the JCCC's Pathways Project, uh, which is the college's commitment to systemic success strategy for all degree and certification seeking students. Uh, initial work this spring will be the integration of the ACU campus, uh, which is a student success tool approved last semester. The second one remaining is the academic student support, uh, and that's going to be monitoring the success, success of ACU placure. Um, this committee will be focused on student success by reviewing programs, receiving faculty sabbatical presentations, reviewing the needs analysis of new programs with advisory committees made up of experts in the field from our community, and in the work of the continuing education department. Uh, my fellow board members have taken up some interest in certain areas of the work to be done in this committee, and I look forward to working with them. This committee will meet the first Monday of every month at 8 a.m. to 9.30 in this boardroom. Thank you. Appreciate it. You have an aggressive agenda and lots of work to be done. I like assertive. <laughs> uh, Trustee Lindstrom, management report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the management committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, January 3rd, uh, right here in the boardroom. The information related to the management meeting is on page 3 through 17 of the board packet. The management committee received several presentations from <coughs> staff. Uh, Dr. Larson, Dr. Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President of Finance and Administrative Services, presented information on facility use agreement with Olathe Medical Center for the use of Olathe Health Education Center, or OHEC is the acronym there. Uh, this agreement can be found on the consent agenda, ad agenda on page 66 of the board packet. Tom Clayton, uh, Director of Insurance and Risk Management, reported on the college's insurance program and provided us a pretty in-depth uh, uh, brochure on all the insurance programs for the college. Susan Ryder, Director of Accounting Services and Grants, gave us a presentation of financial ratios. Susan was able to show a projection of the college's financial ratios since we have moved forward with borrowing funds to invest in our facility master plan. The college's solid financial position uh, enables us to proceed with these facilities' investments and still maintain financial ratios within ideal ranges. There has been um, a comment uh, or before the meeting uh, and with a request that perhaps those ratios be provided at some point to the trustees. And if we could do that, that would be terrific. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Lears, uh, Associate Vice President of Financial Services, and CFO, Chief Financial Officer, reviewed the semi-annual report of the budget reallocations. This report can be found on pages 9 and, nine and 10 of the packet. 
She also gave a monthly budget update. Uh, Mitch Borchers, uh, Associate Vice President of Business Services, presented the Sol Sulis Report. Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President of Campus Services and Facility Planning, gave a monthly update on capital infrastructure projects, and this report is on page 11 of the packet. Rex also reviewed the report of financial status of the, finance of the facilities master plan projects. It is in your packet on page 12. Uh, Tom Pagano, the Vice President for Information Services and CIO, provided a quarterly update on projects uh, uh, on projects in information services, and this report begins on page 13 of the packet. The management committee has two recommendations to present this evening. For the first, uh, Dr. Larson presented an interlocal agreement with the City of Olathe for a Neighborhood Revitalization Area, or NRA. The City of Olathe created a Neighborhood Revitalization, uh, an NRA, in 2008, and Johnson County Community College was a party to that 2008 <coughs> agreement. Uh, the estimated lost revenue attributed to this uh, 2008 NRA was approximately $19,500 from the period 2008 through 2016. The 10-year rebate under the 2008 agreement expired on uh, December 31st, 2017. The City of Olathe also created a separate NRA in 2017, and Johnson County was a party to that Olathe 2017 NRA agreement. Rebates lost uh, or <coughs> lost revenue attributed to that agreement uh, in 2017 are not known yet. And we will, once we have that report, we'll report back. Uh, the requirements and tax rebates for a proposal for a proposed 2008 NRA are similar to both the 2008 and 2017 NRAs. One key difference in this uh, rebate is that uh, it is rebates are being extended to residential properties, which were not allowed in the 2017 NRA. The 2018 NRA is the same as the 2008 NRA, and I know this is getting a little bit confusing, um, where residential use of rebates is being encouraged. A site plan of this area can be seen in your packet on page 8. Uh, in order for Olathe to fulfill the legal requirements of the state statute, the Johnson County Community College Board is being asked to approve a resolution agreeing to the to enter into a, another local agreement concerning the proposed 2018, I'm sorry, NRA. The college has generally, generally viewed such programs as beneficial to the county, and in this instance does not believe that the rebates lost would have any material negative effect on the college's tax revenue. Therefore, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees approve the recommendation of the college administration to enter into an interlocal agreement with the City of Olathe agreeing to participate in the proposed 2018 Neighborhood Revitalization Area as described above, and I would make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? This is... Dr. Larson? No. I was just going to add that uh, Mr. Daniel Yoza, the Assistant City Attorney for the City of Olathe, is here. I'm sorry, Daniel, I didn't see you back there um, prior to that. So if you had questions about this, please, um, I'm sure he'd be happy to, okay. to answer them. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Thank Trustee Cross? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was just going to ask, didn't Mr. Shaver address us last year, Ron Shaver? Yeah. Was that a different I believe so, yes. Meeting? Yes. We, uh, we I have, believe, I, I don't we, we do we this did. annually, or it, it comes up. Uh, we did discuss it a year. Thank you for being here. Uh, any uh, any uh, additional information you'd like to share? Uh, no, I, I think you did a great job explaining the program. Um, this is one one of our tool kit pieces that we use for improvement of the city. Um, if you look at the map in the packet, you'll see it's it's uh, centered around the downtown area in Olathe, mm -hmm. which is an area that needs some of the incentives to make um, improvements happen in that area, particularly the residential uh, uh, properties where it's, it's just necessary to get people to, to do some of those improvements to provide that small rebate uh, to, to make that happen. Um, 
the, the language was tweaked a little bit between 2008 and, and 2018. It's the same program. We're expecting about the same number of participants, not, not a massive program, probably 50 to 60 is what we got last time, or it's just that um, little push to get, to get people over the edge there to, to do it. Uh, Ron did present uh, to, the, to you last year. The, the, the distinction between the two areas is that that area last year is a, is a small commercial area where it was just hard for us to get anything built there right up next to the train tracks. Uh, this one is the downtown area where there's some older houses that we'd like to see uh, improved to uh, just improve the aesthetics and, and such to the downtown area. So that's the goal of the program here. Thank you very much. Trustee Lawson. Uh, from the data that you might have from the previous time that this was done to the appraisal rates that were just recently done, have you seen uh, an increase in the, this incentive for the previous group of people? Yes. Yeah, so the between 2008 and 2016, which is where we have data, the, the appraised value of the properties in the district went from about $3.5 to about $7 million. Um, a, a couple of those are... Um, are just a couple, there, there were a couple of commercial areas that, that were a big part of that, but then uh, the number of residential around 30 uh, comprised the other part of that uh, increased appraised value that happened because of, uh, that happened to pro two properties in the program. Does that answer your question? Good. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And Name? now Lee's saying yes. I, I, I knew I'd get him to say yes. <laughs> uh, Trustee Lindstrom, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next recommendation is for the transfer of funds from the college to the foundation. The Sustainability Committee has requested that $12,000 of recycling proceeds be transferred to the Johnson County Community College Foundation to be used for scholarships. Therefore, it is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees authorize the transfer of $12,000 from the Sustainability Initiatives Fund to the Johnson County Community College Foundation to be used for student scholarships, and I will make that motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I conclude my report, I would ask that uh, Trustee Musil or Trustee Snyder, if they have anything that they would like to add as they are already part of the management committee. I have nothing. Throw a report. Loan me. Nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, David. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. President's recommendation, Treasurer's report, Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Treasurer's report can be found on... Uh, Page 18 of the board packet, page 20 of the PDF, and uh, the following pages contain the treasurer's report for the month ended November 30th, 2017. During November, the college made the following revenue bond payments as reflected in the revenue bonds and debt service fund, in section five of the treasurer's report. Payment number 13 of 33 on the series 2011 revenue bonds of $230,813. Payment number 10 of 30 on series 2012 revenue bonds, $517,800. And payment number 4 of 12 on series 2015 revenue bonds, uh, totaling $721,000, totaling $1.469 million. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within uh, the approved budgetary limits, Mr. Chair, and it is therefore the recommendation of uh, the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's report for the month ended November, November 2017, subject to audit. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion. Uh, thanks, Nancy. Motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Trustee Lawson. I would just request a report. I'm sure you have it somewhere, Trustee Cross, of any kind of tracking of assets that we might have in storage that we're maybe paying fees on, maybe art, you know, insurance, things like that, things that we might, equipment. I just have a curiosity of maybe at the next meeting. Sure. Does that make sense? Trustee Lawson, I'd, I'd be glad to check with staff. We, we, I don't no, personally we, keep that, yeah, but uh, we have that I'd be glad okay. to get with Ms. Lears or uh, Barbara Larson, I think is the Executive Vice President of Finance. Yes. I, I will check so with Mr. her. So Mr. Chairman then, <laughs> yeah. can, can I get a you. report? Yeah, Thank we'll, you. we'll uh, get that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, 
All, I guess we, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Trustee Cross. Monthly report to the board, Dr. Sopcich. Thank you, uh, Trustee. Trustee Cook, a couple things. Um, first of all, you have your monthly report to the board. I hope you take the opportunity to review this. It shows a lot of the great work um, the staff has done, um, and it's really just over the first couple of weeks of the year, so it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good document. Um, I just want to salute our debate team. Um, earlier, Trustee Musil had mentioned um, how we have um, other organizations that take advantage of that of the student activities fee. This is one. Um, our debate team had a very, very successful, um, uh, very successful tournaments in Dallas over the holidays. Um, Justin Stanley, the debate coach, and Daniel Stout, the assistant debate coach, sent this out. Um, what I'd like to be able to do is just read the names of the players who, or names of the players, <laughs> names of the debaters um, who were very instrumental in these, in these victories. Josh Moncur, Sophia Swanson, Sarah Cobble, Bijan, Esfandieri, uh, Louis Ferris, and Gavin Stockdale. Um, I'd like to share with you uh, some of the teams that they, that they defeated. Um, Missouri State University, University of Florida, University of Wyoming, um, University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, did I mention University of Wyoming? Uh, NYU, uh, SMU, I mean, it's quite a, quite a list. University of Texas at Dallas, University of Houston. Um, University of Texas at San Antonio. So um, it's quite a tribute to our debate team to excel at that level um, on a national level. And also, Josh Moncur um, was recognized as the top overall speaker in the varsity division, a rare honor for a student from a community college competing against students primarily from four-year colleges and universities. So that's quite a tribute, not just to the debaters themselves, but also to their coaches, Justin and Daniel. So I wanted to share that with you, with you today. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different here that, I, that I've never really done. Um, as you know, I spent the last uh, week in, in Pakistan. And this is how uh, such a thing happens. Um, if you recall, a couple of years ago, we hosted about six Pakistani uh, scholars, professors from the university, um, Sucker um, University, IBA, um, and it's in Sucker, Pakistan. And they came here to learn a little bit more about how we do things and, and how the college operates and develop many relationships throughout, throughout the campus. Um, as a part of that State Department grant, there was an opportunity for, for me to go, as well as a, a faculty member here, and participate in a conference on community colleges being hosted by um, Sucker uh, University. And so I uh, jumped at that chance, um, especially since the State Department was paying for it. They were very <laughs> enthusiastic about our participation, and they were very enthusiastic about the president of of this college, of an American community college, to go to a conference on community colleges. So I brought some photos. And it'll be kind of like, this is what I did over the summer. Um, <laughs> kind of like a little summer vacation uh, trip here to Pakistan. I turned it on. So this was the conference. Oh, and I'd like to recognize Melinda Bryan Smith, Anthony Fennaro for who've really masterminded the grant. I mean, this is a significant grant, several hundred thousand dollars. We're the only community college in, in Pakistan, or the only community college in the United States that's a part of this, about 20 universities uh, throughout Pakistan. It's quite an, an initiative launched by the State Department, and so Melinda, a uh, big part of that, and also Tom Patterson and Jeanette Jasperson, who do an incredible job in our international studies area. And for the benefit of the public, there are 1,108 community colleges in the nation. <clears throat> and if you'll remember, Dr. Sopchik said we were the only community college chosen by the State Department. And so they wanted to do this conference down there on the concept of community colleges in Pakistan. Um, I was invited to do the keynote to this conference, and Beth Gulley, one of our um, professors in the English department, also joined me because she was going to present at the conference as well. Her husband, who's an English professor at Nyosho uh, Community College, also joined us, and together they would do faculty workshops. Now, before we got started on the trip, um, which we departed on, um, <laughs> on January 5th, um, uh, um, President Trump uh, put us off on a, on a positive footing when he, his first tweet of the year, tweet of the year was one where he um, started criticizing Pakistan. And then on January 2nd, I believe, they, they decided that they would withhold military aid to Pakistan. And we were like, couldn't he have just held off for maybe a week uh, before he did this? 
Um, so that kind of set the tone, and quite frankly, we didn't know what to expect uh, when, we, when we arrived down there. Uh, this is a picture of, of, of Dr. Gully and her, and her uh, spouse, uh, Jeremy Gully. And you can see Beth over there as well. And she's with um, Dr. Fida, who was here. He was one of the Pakistanis that was here. Um, he's got his PhD from Michigan State. He spent six years there. He's holding a picture of his experience here um, at Johnson County. Uh, he's there with Ed Lovett um, because they both work in um, distance learning as well as a variety of other members of, 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 of our campus. Um, that's very prominent in his office, uh, that photograph. He holds, it, he holds it quite dearly. He was, I guess, our primary host during that, during that trip. So I went down there thinking that this is going to be kind of a small little deal in a classroom. And um, what you see there is a banner stretched across uh, a major building which houses the auditorium. And you can see our logo is up in the left-hand corner, which is kind of cool to see the logo of your college uh, in, in, in Pakistan, right? With the American flag on the right side and Sucker IBA, the university that was hosting us, announcing um, this conference. This is inside the, uh, that building, uh, another gigantic banner uh, that stretches across. Again, you can see our logo. And I, and, I, and I gotta tell you, it gives you an intense sense of pride being from Johnson County Community College, but also being a citizen of the United States. It's kind of cool seeing some of the great things that we're trying to do in Pakistan. Um, a lot of flowers on, on that stage. Up in the right-hand corner, uh, it's, uh, you can see the little sign to the left. And, um, and I'm, of course, uh, being very nice to the guards um, especially those that are holding M16s. Um, this is pretty, this is very a common sight in Pakistan um, as you have armed um, guards everywhere. So every uh, store you would go into, there would be an armed guard at, that, at the doorway. Uh, the campus itself has about 24 full-time police officers, um, fully armed, comparable to what we have. And um, the security, needless to say, is, 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 is pretty tight. Obviously, this was not the size of a classroom, and it was somewhat intimidating when we got there. Um, so I gave the keynote on the concept of, of community colleges. Um, actually, it's a U.S. community college model, its role in workforce development and higher education. And then Beth followed up, and Beth, um, her, her remarks were developmental education, concept of learning centers. There were about 14 speakers in one day, well, actually in maybe three quarters of the day, um, uh, up on the stage. Uh, and the first three rows were VIPs. The, uh, the conference was a huge success um, as the guest list ex went way beyond what they thought was going to happen. And, and I'm talking about um, presidents from, community, from, not from, from universities all over Pakistan. It was fascinating. Um, the person there on the right, uh, her name is Dr. Burjis Ashraf. Um, she works at Houston Community College. And she was speaking as well. She teamed up with her husband, who's Dr. Ivad uh, Ashraf, and he's uh, head of, of Kida Azam University in Islamabad. They were kind of like the power couple um, at, the, at the conference. And she was fascinating. Um, and of course, I think Beth's remarks were uh, superior. But it was, it was um, an incredible insight into um, higher ed in Pakistan. We took a break and we went outside, and on the left you'll see those little, uh, kind of like little booths. And inside each one of those are students, you know, pretty much from um, grades one through, one through 14. And they have their demonstration models there, all related to science. Um, Sucker IBA has 10 community colleges. And what they call a community college is basically grades K through 14. One of the biggest challenges they have in Pakistan is to keep, is to keep students in school. And so they have been very aggressive um, uh, with trying to manage this and to establish these. And it's, very, it's, it's highly regarded across the entire country of Pakistan. And it's cool for us to be a part of that. And so you can see students on the right. They were amazing students, incredibly, uh, in, incredibly well-spoken. Um, and providing significant depth into those projects, none of which I could understand, as they were all science related. Um, you can see the young women here on the left. The one with the banner is, a, uh, is like student body president. And on the right, um, those, those guys were absolutely amazing. 
Um, they've created kind of like little mini robots. Um, everyone's public speaking skills were superb. Um, adjacent to that was a gigantic tent. And so for our um, break, uh, we all adjourned in the tent um, to have cookies and foods and what have you. On the right's a selfie. Um, selfies were really big, and the gentleman with the beard is obviously taking the selfie. And um, I, I, they, loved, they, they loved having their pictures taken with Beth and Jeremy and myself. We're Westerners. They really don't have a lot of Westerners uh, visit their university. And so it was, it was kind of fun. It was like we were rock stars for a day uh, because everybody wanted to have their pictures taken with us. And, and you can see how they're kind of hamming it up for the photo. Isn't that like every day for you? <laughs> Thank you, Trusty Cross. Okay. <laughs> and so again, we took a, we took a lot of pictures. Um, and you can see all the students. And it's, it's really fascinating. And, and, and I can't say enough for the generosity and the warmth um, and the hospitality of the Pakistani people. I can get you a CD of this. Uh, this was the party in the evening. This was the celebration that brings the uh, conference to an end. Two such bands that performed for us. Ultimately, by the end of the evening, um, we were all dancing to the to the music of the of the second band, which sounded pretty comparable to that. I'd like for you to read this. This was on one of the walls of uh, one of the buildings, and it, it, in the English translation is: "We are content with Allah's apportionment, so knowledge for us and wealth for the unenlightened wealth is going to perish soon, while knowledge shall endure and never vanish." And so the respect that they have for education and the acquisition of knowledge is paramount to what they do there. The gentleman on the right, um, he was uh, a member of the staff there, and every time I walked by, he would salute me. Um, and so I asked if he could take his picture, and of course he saluted when I took his, when I took his picture. <laughs> Terrific guy. This is their campus. And you can see students, no different than what you have here. It's a wonderful campus and uh, just enjoying. This was their first day of classes. And again, you can, they're, they're all smiling, they're hamming it up for the, the photo. The colors are spectacular um, in, in, what, in what the young women wear. This is another shot of the campus. Um, flowers aren't even really blooming yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the, in, in prime season it must be kind of amazing. The grass is cut very short and they're putting these roadways in like this. This entire campus is, is sealed off, by the way, with, you know, with a steel gate and high walls and barbed wire and all. It's very, very secure. And it's a residential campus as well. They're building, I counted maybe six to seven buildings on two separate campuses that, that were close by. Um, you can see the workers on the ledges there. Um, they, they take anywhere from three to five years just to build one building. They can only build as fast as when they get their distributions from the province. Uh, but they have big plans in what they're doing at this university. <clears throat> big into solar. Um, their, their objective is to be 100% solar uh, powered by 2030. They have, they have a goal for that. Uh, even their street lights are powered by solar panels. You'll notice on the left are backpacks. Um, that was jam-packed full of backpacks. And I asked them, um, isn't anybody concerned about somebody you know, stealing a backpack? And they looked at me like they didn't understand what I was saying. Not even an issue. No one is going to take someone else's backpack. On the right uh, is Jeremy and Beth. Uh, they're doing a teacher's workshop. Gives you some idea of the classroom facility that they have. And Jeremy and Beth were, were superstars uh, with regards to how they interacted with their faculty. This is their learning resource center, what we'd refer to as a library. Um, the gentleman on the right is uh, Dr. Siddiqui. He is the, um, he, he's the head of everything. 
and he's the one that makes it all happen. He's highly revered and respected throughout the country. Hmm. I thought these were fascinating in their library. The first is a quote from Oprah. Reading is a way for me to expand my mind, open my eyes, and fill my heart. And remarkably, the other one is from William S. Burroughs, um, former resident of Lawrence, Kansas. Um, the purpose of technology is not to confuse the brain, but to serve the body. I, the last person I would expect to see would be uh, Burroughs uh, in Pakistan. <laughs> but this is really the key thing. When they came here, they, uh, they learned about how we operate our math resource center. And that's one of the things that they took back. And they basically recreated a math resource center there. And this is a big accomplishment. I think of, of, of a lot of the um, universities that are there, um, this seems to be one of the most tangible outcomes. And we're the ones who made it happen. And so you can see on the right, they have all the tutors there. And this is during the day. And it's at, it's at full, full speed. Why do you think it's a math resource center? Yes. Yeah, obviously, uh, most of the students uh, have difficulty in the mathematics and uh, mathematics. But it's too, we can say that it's uh, too difficult to uh, get. So here is the place we can get uh, amazing help from the tutors. Tutors are always available here. If you are taking, uh, if you are uh, taking any kind of difficulty, so we can get help from here. They will always be here and uh, they will help us. Sir, just makes our concept. They it gives give us concept here and. Uh, These students um, love the resource center. They um, love the opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutoring. Um, we spoke to one of the tutors there. The enthusiasm level was phenomenal. It's something that everyone here can take great pride in because this is an idea that they took back to Pakistan from Johnson County Community College and they've executed it very well. See, I told you. <laughs> The, the, the gentleman on the right is one of the uh, tutors. Mm. <laughs> we um, would travel from where we were staying to the university, which was about a five minute ride, and this is what we would, would see on our, on our way. Uh, um, all the, the trucks and the, the buses are all very um, uh, graphically painted. They're, they're beautiful, actually. And on the right, it gives you some idea of the, of the general traffic. Um, and these uh, pictures were all taken from inside of, a, inside of a moving van. And you can see you have buses and carts pulled by, by burros, uh, a lot of mopeds. It's in, and, and on the left, the far left, you can see how high those trucks can get stacked with regard to what they can put in them. Um, a lot of people are transported in the back of little pickup trucks. In this case, if you look to the right, um, there's a mom, a mother holding her child, and I would presume the father uh, hanging on at the back. And these cars are going, you know, talking 50 miles per hour, um, if not faster. And, uh, and, you know, there's a gentleman on a bike. Um, people are walking. Uh, it's incredibly, it's an incredibly um, active, active scene. This was an, they took us to one of their so-called community colleges. We were greeted with um, uh, wonderful little children and beautiful bouquets uh, when, we, when we pulled up. And Jeremy um, pulled a, he did a teacher's conference there. Um, and you can see all the kids who are out there doing uh, what children do any place, at any school. Uh, they're having their recess. On the way back, we stopped in the countryside and um, and picked guava uh, in a guava orchard, and these little kids came out of nowhere. And you know what suckers trying to do is is significant in their community. And I think with our college's involvement, uh, they are making significant pro uh, progress. But ultimately, it comes down to the children. And these kids are absolutely adorable. And so it kind of puts a face on um, uh, you know on a country. And I think we can be so proud that our college is involved uh, in a part of the world that, that, that is so welcoming and respectful of our involvement. So I'd like to share that with you and thank you uh, for this opportunity, not just for me to have gone, 
but also for our involvement with this grant. It certainly elevates the college in the eyes across, uh, across the country and the work that we're doing in Pakistan. Any questions? Um, I, as I sit here and look at this image and the enthusiasm on the faces of all the students, it's, it's too bad that politics get in the way of people and politics is about people. <clears throat> but it's a shame of what we could become uh, internationally as to what we are. Any questions or comments of Dr. Sopcich? Trustee Lawson. I just, thank you so much for going. Uh, I just I can't imagine how the people of Pakistan see the United States when they have when our president tweets out things like that. So to be able to have an opportunity to represent. Um, another part of our country and the people here. Uh, it humbles me. Um, it puts my own troubles um, into reality when you're considering the you know, difficulty of driving on ice versus mm -hmm. how about going to school uh, where it's locked down and you have walls and M16s guarding you. Um, the safety laws, too, it just having children in the backs of those cars. Um, just hanging on basically and then just seeing these faces right here and seeing their clothes and there's no barely any shoes on just puts that into perspective of um, our own lives so I appreciate this thank you thank you but you can tell trustee Lawson and I have an age difference because we used to sleep in the back window of the car <laughs> long before car seats um, but I, I want to thank Joe too for going because it, it sounds like a wonderful opportunity, and from the outside, it looks like you just all you did was take some nice pictures and give a nice speech. Uh, it's an 18-hour travel there, um, eight, tri time zone difference, uh, a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice, and things down here down here didn't stop. And Dr. Larson, I know, like you were the executive in charge, so thank you and the entire staff for for sucking it up while Joe was gone. But I, I think it's incredible that our community college, uh, Jerry, I did that math. Let's see if I still have it here. One out of 1,108, we're 0.09, 0.0253% of the community colleges in America were participating, and that was just us. So and we thank were, you very much. I'm serious about the, the, the honor that is for this college, and to have you go over there and represent us, uh, I, I'm proud of it. Yeah, and it's reflective of the work, Melinda, and the team that's been right. involved in these things. Thank you. Um, and, and I can tell you, the people at the State Department, um, they, they really love working with us and respect us a great deal. So um, it's quite a team here that makes all this, brings all this together. And you can actually see the fruits of some of the things that we've done here um, over there. So it's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. And now for the lightning round? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> We do have a piece of old business tonight. Uh, several months ago, uh, then Trustee uh, Chair Musil uh, brought before us a number of trustee of board policy uh, issues, responsibilities, code of conduct, code of ethics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we did bring those forward in December, and uh, we, we had some recommendations on some um, uh, language consistency. That's been taken care of. I think, Trustee Musil, you have uh, looked it over as well. Uh, and uh, for the trustees that were here in December looking at that, and for Trustees Snyder and Lawson, this is probably in January the first time you've probably seen this, but uh, uh, I would at least put this motion on the table for discussion. It is the recommendation of the board chair that the Board of Trustees approve modification to the following policies and procedures, board responsibilities, code of conduct, code of ethics, professional development, resolution of censure, meetings of the board policy and operating procedure committees, number and selection of trustees and officers. Additionally, it is a recommendation that the trustees approve deletion of the following policies and procedures. Non-participation, code of operation, personnel matters, interpretations, statement uh, one, regionalization and trustee emeritus policy and operating procedure as is shown subsequently in the board packet. And you have a detail a graphic, uh, charts of those policies plus red line uh, additions, deletions. And I would, at this point, ask Trustee Musil if he has any comments to make. Have you made that as a motion? I made it. I'll make that as a motion. Thank you. And I would ask for a second. I would second that. And then it sounds like a lot, and it's a thick piece. These haven't been reviewed since, I think, 1994 uh, as a whole. And I appreciate Tanya and her staff as our general counsel doing that. Uh, most of this is just clarification and cleanup. Uh, it is not, there are no wholesale changes with the, with the real exception of deleting the trustee emeritus uh, opportunity, which was 
really allowed us to, to, to honor ourselves or an honor a former trustee member and after talking to some former trustees, I think it was not, it's not necessary. There are other ways they're honored, other bodies that honor them. And so um, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions or, or uh, direct them to Tanya if somebody has questions about the policies. But it's more of an update than any kind of material change. Any questions? Just an Trustee an, Lawson? Just an inquiry on page 51 for my co committee on the learning quality. I just want to make sure that Dr. McLeod and Randy and uh, Karen, you guys have reviewed that and as well as the committee, if those new changes to what was added to our committee um, policy, if, if everyone's on page. Okay. Okay. So Any other questions? Any discussion? Any discussion? Was anybody ever actually named Trustee Americas? I think... Uh, Maybe Hugh Spear? Hugh Spear, I do not believe. I, I, I think Virginia Cray, Krebs was. She may be the only one. Mm -hmm. Just curious. Yeah. It, it'd have to be Krebs and Spear. I, I, I seem to remember that it was odd to me that Hugh Spear was not a trustee emeritus, even though he's the name of the foundation's number one award. Uh, but I, there are only two, and they're, they're, I think they're two of the charter members. I'm not sure who else it would have been. Maybe uh, okay. Will Billington. I don't I'm yeah, trying to remember, yeah. but it's been it's been a long time ago, and um, it, we I think my judgment was, and talked to some former trustees that are, that are still living, obviously that it was an unnecessary thing, and really would put the board in a tough position. If somebody got nominated, how do you vote against them without embarrassing them? And it's really not nobody up here's doing this for. Uh, I think we're all doing it for the big salaries and not for the ego. Nancy, any comments or questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Trustee Musil and Tanya, for uh, getting that done. It was a big job. We have no new business this evening. Uh, reports from board liaisons. Dr. Arjo, you're first up. And while you're coming up, I just have to ask you a very personal question. <laughs> During uh, Dr. Sopcich's report on Pakistan and that philosophical quote in the library, you seem to you seem to get a big grin on your face from year to year. Would you like to explain it? Yeah, that's just an unexpected juxtaposition. <laughs> just put it that way. Um, he was an interesting character and an interesting writer. The sort of person you expect to show up in a place like that, to be sure, if you know his works. Um, if you don't, one of his novels was called Junkie, and that was kind of a big part of his life. So. Um, well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to our two new uh, trustee members. As always, appreciate the chance to, uh, to talk. Uh, before I forget, uh, the FA has not met, but we are going to be meeting next week, and I want to take this opportunity to first say that our meetings are going to be every fourth Thursday of the month at 3.30. Um, I'll have to set the room. I'm hoping it'll be the same room we had last semester, which was GEB 342. But let me take, before I forget to send out emails and so on, that you're all invited to standing invitation to come to our meetings. They're open. We always enjoy having trustees and administrators come. And if you want to address us, that'd be great. If you just want to observe, uh, that would also be great. So again, every fourth Thursday of the month, uh, 3.30. Um, while Joe was in Pakistan, we were having in-service, <laughs> and it was a kind of disjointed one because of the snow day, so it felt like a snow day complete. I was really looking forward to the all uh, faculty meeting, because we're going to talk about academic freedom, which is one of my favorite subjects these days. <laughs> I was talking to Mickey earlier this week that maybe we'll find some opportunities to do that over the course of the semester and not let, uh, what are the 350 copies you made <laughs> yes. go to waste? I had one for every fac full-time faculty member. And they're uh, sitting on a shelf currently. So we'll find a way to get those into people's uh, hands. Uh, a couple <laughs> things that um, happened I'd like to mention. One is uh, uh, winners of the Distinguished Service Award were announced. I'm not going to reiterate that, but I congratulate them. And also, I think this is a, a nice way to showcase accomplishments of the faculty. And every single one I'm sure was deserving, as were probably all the ones who did not win. Um, so it's always a great thing to uh, see the faculty uh, acknowledged in that fashion. Um, also, this year saw the revival of the Master Teacher Workshop. This was kind of a tradition. Um, I did it when I first got here 21 years ago. And for one reason or another, it kind of fizzled out not too long after that so now it's back in business and that's uh, great so this is an opportunity for faculty who have been here for a while to meet up with newer faculty and swap ideas and 
uh, learn from one another. And it's also a really great opportunity to meet people from well outside your area. I still have people I am friendly with and got to meet only because we were in the Master Teacher Workshop 21 years ago, people from far-flung parts of, um, of the college. So this is gonna be a big semester. Obviously we have negotiations looming. We're gonna be exchanging letters just uh, a couple of weeks. Um, and if I just gonna wrap up with say nothing about the topics obviously, but just kind of uh, thinking about heading into that. I think we're reminded at the beginning of this meeting of two things. Uh, one is sometimes the difficulty that comes with trying to reconcile taking care of supporting things you find valuable with making responsible fiscal decisions. And secondly, when those situations happen, as they invariably do, uh, decisions that make perfect sense from one perspective may look quite different from somebody who takes a different perspective. And that's just part of the kind of business we do and it's to be ex expected. Um, we go to negotiations. On one level, we're working out a contract between the bargaining unit members and the board of trustees. But I think we all appreciate that the significance of negotiations is bigger than that. People look to see what happens there uh, for all sorts of indications of where the college puts its emphasis, its value, and so on. Um, so I would hope, I fully expect, that as we go into that, as the discussion gets going, both sides remain mindful of the goodwill on the other, and um, I hope good things come of it, I expect good things to come of it. So thank you. Well said, thank you, Dr. Arjo. Uh, any questions of Dr. Arjo? Well said. Thank you, appreciate it, and thanks for your patience. <coughs> Research Triangle, Trustee Lindstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a brief report. We haven't met since our last meeting here at the Board of Trustees, but uh, the, uh, for the benefit of our new trustees and any other people in the audience who have heard one of my reports for Jason before, uh, the Johnson County Education Research Triangle Authority is a unique partnership among Johnson County, the University of Kansas, and Kansas State University. The partnership was created in 2008 when county voters supported the 1 8 cent sales tax to create economic stimulus and advance academic research and business endeavors at K State Olathe. KU Edwards Campus and the KU Clinical Research Center. If you want more information about uh, JSER, um, you could go to uh, www.jocotriangle.com, follow, uh, uh, follow JSER on Facebook and Twitter. Um, but for the month of December, uh, sales tax revenues uh, were uh, 1,425,384.85, which is 1.21% over the same period last year. Uh, sales tax revenues for the annual, for all of 2017, were $17,689,024.42, which was about just under 3% over last year. So sales tax were up about 3%. Uh, in 2017, and that uh, that amount uh, in, that amount of increase mirrors Johnson County's average over the, approximately the last three years. Uh, the next meeting of the Johnson County Education Research Triangle will be on Monday, May 7th uh, at uh, 7:30 a.m. at the KU campus, KU Edwards campus, which is at 12600 South Rivera, just up the road here. Thank you. Any questions of Trustee Lindstrom on the research triangle? Appreciate your report. Thank you. Uh, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees has not met as a group since December. Um, our next meeting is February 15th. Uh, that is the day that we recognize recipients of Phi Theta Kappa. Uh, at a luncheon, and it's a full day at the state, uh, it's a half day at the state house, I should say, in the morning. And uh, then we recognize the Phi Theta Kappa Award, Phi Theta Kappa Award winners at lunch. Uh, I believe Trustee Lawson and Trustee Ingram will be attending. I will be there, and I think uh, you will be there as well. I'm not sure of other staff that will be there, but that's always a big day. And then we have a, a meeting in the afternoon. That's also the meeting of our board meeting, so we'll have to hustle back that night for our February board meeting. Uh, last evening, uh, Dr. Sopcich and I did attend, uh, we were guests of the Kansas Board of Regents. Uh, the uh, 
college presidents and board chairs are invited annually to a, a dinner to just kind of build a relationship. Uh, we did have a working session around the table uh, dealing with two or three questions. Uh, how can the Kansas Board of Regents help community colleges? How do we benefit uh, our communities in which we live and operate? And uh, uh, what do we kind of see as uh, challenges moving forward? So uh, in each table reported out, uh, and I would just say that uh, some common denominators are concurrent enrollment, uh, how we manage that in our 19 colleges. And I believe that um, if my memory serves me right, we're about 30% of concurrent enrollment in the state. So we, it's, it's important to us. Uh, of course, funding, and there was concern about how much of the 350 to 600 million will infringe upon um, funding for community colleges. And uh, so, so those were kind of the basic issues, I think, that, that, that came out. And, and then there, there was a third, and that had to do with how do we send our message to the state legislators of the impact of community college. That goes back to that second point of how how does your community college impact your community? And we have a terrific story to tell in each of our communities. And while we have differences, we, we all have the common denominator of serving the needs of all students of all ages to change their lives. And all colleges have very compelling stories like we've heard tonight uh, of how that occurs in their communities. So it's a matter of communicating and messaging and trying to get that support. I don't know if you have any other comments. Uh, you there were there today as well with the cops, uh, Council of Presidents. Um, I think <laughs> now, now. Let's not, um, I think the, the, the primary purpose for last night was for the regions to interact with various college presidents and and their board chairs, and so that was it's always productive. It's always a lot of fun. Um, I was fortunate to sit with Dan Thomas. He's uh, a member of the regions, and of course, he's from Johnson County. Um, and we had a great discussion about some of the challenges that we have and what perhaps the regents could do to, to help community colleges. So um, it was a nice evening. I think this is the second or third year we've been doing this. And, uh, and of course, Washburn, uh, we had it at Washburn. So um, it was, uh, uh, we look forward to doing it again next year. And, uh, and we'll, see, we'll see what benefits come from it. Any questions about that, KCCT? Thank you. Uh, Foundation, Trustee Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the foundation did not meet, so I therefore do not have a report this month. The foundation meets next week at some point, Wednesday, Thursday, 24th, whatever day that is. So I'll look forward to delivering a report. Actually, Trustee uh, uh, Nancy will give that next month. I would, uh, if I could just backtrack slightly, I was also in Topeka today and, and thought uh, the festivities were great. Uh, the only point I would make is I visited with several senators this afternoon and, and I was telling them that I was that this was my first board meeting and they were all uh, elated about uh, their own community colleges. I talked to one in particular, Senator Bowers, who has Cloud County and then also uh, new Senator Goddard who has two uh, community colleges in his area. So all very proud of, of what each individual college does. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a very compelling story. Our next item is the consent agenda. This is an item where we deal with regular and routine items. Uh, uh, regular in nature. Uh, if any board member has an item they'd like to pull, I'd entertain that motion now. Uh, if not, I would ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. aye. A mo uh, no. Uh, opposed? <coughs> motion carries unanimously. Uh, we do have an executive session this evening. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussions pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, exception relating to co consultations with the board's bargaining representation in employer-employee negotiations. This session will last 45 minutes. Uh, we will resume the open meeting in this same location. No action will be taken during this session. We would like to invite Joe Sopchik, Barbara Larson, Becky Centlevere, Jim Lane, Mickey McLeod, Randy Weber, Tanya Wilson, and Melody Rail to join in this session. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion to do so. So moved. Uh, second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, it is now, according to the clock, the wall clock, 7. 49, uh, let's convene at, give you a, a 10 minute break, and we'll convene at seven o'clock, and the session will end at 745. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries, thank you.
I'll go to Sprint. Thank you. We are back in open session, and uh, I would like to entertain a motion to go back into executive session for the purpose of discussions pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, exception relating to consultations with the board's bargaining representation and employer employee negotiations. This session will last 15 minutes. We will resume the open meeting in the same location. No action will be taken during this session. Uh, we would like to invite Joe Sobchuk, Barbara Larson, Becky Sentliver, Jim Lane, Mickey McLeod, Randy Weber, Tanya Wilson, Melody Rail to join us in this session. I would entertain a motion. A second. Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We're starting at 7.48 uh, and we'll finish at 8.03. Thank you. We uh, are back in open session. It's 8 o'clock. Uh, no action was taken in executive session, and I would ask for a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, our January meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy.